Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sayed Zishan Hussain, and I work for the city of Amsterdam in Team New Upper Harbor. I'm basically in the Department of Sustainability and Urban Planning. And as you know, we are here in this meet and learn session, which is part of, which is actually a learning platform and is a part of uh, Shore Euro Delta, which is strategic urban uh, region uh, Euro Delta. And we, uh, it is nice if for the people who don't know what Shore Euro, Euro Delta is, I will just take a couple of minutes and show you a very short movie about what Shore Euro Delta is and what are we working on. And yeah, I will share my screen now. Global population has been shifting more and more from rural to urban regions and also across regions. Approximately 45 million people live in a highly urbanized region known as the Euro Delta, with a vibrant economy and a strategic location surrounded by the Rhine, Moose and Scheldt. The region has the potential to become one of the world's most developed and sustainable mega regions. It is our planet's biggest spot of light. That's why the Sure Euro Delta Network was created. To seek cross-border cooperation within the European network of metropolitan regions and to contribute towards stronger partnerships among cities and regions within the Euro Delta and beyond. By focusing on exploring opportunities for the region and knowledge exchange with members of the Metrix network, the network explores how the cooperation in the Euro Delta region can benefit all inhabitants. The Euro Delta is a vital economical hotspot of the European Union, where not only a joint history and values are shared, but also similar challenges exist today. And when such challenges are tackled in cross-border collaborations, innovative opportunities and creative ideas are created for the region as a whole. Through this network, we can explore new ways to achieve a harmonious economic, social and territorial development. This enables us to come up with innovative solutions that align with the policies of the EU Green Deal to transform the EU into a modern, resource-efficient and competitive economy. Join us in building a more sustainable future for our region. Anyway, I'll put a link in the chat and everybody can see. Uh, here we go. And now let's go ahead anyway. So today our speaker of the session is uh, uh, Arian Hessing, and he will be talking about uh, Circular. And I'm extremely excited to see what Arian will be sharing about his experiences. And let me give floor to Arian. And Arian, you have all the time. And let's start. Thank you. Thank you, Siet. Um, I watched the video before uh, we met, so it, it's nice. It's very informative, uh, and it's also uh, good to know about the Sure uh, Euro Delta network, which I haven't uh, been in touch with yet. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to to speak about uh, Circular. Um, yeah, we've been working on Circular for the last two and a half years. Uh, as Jan said, he has been involved uh, quite a bit in the beginning but he moved to another direction. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, very curious and I'm also looking forward to your reflections and your questions uh, to hear about how it, how circular could fit in another legal context or in your own, uh, uh, yeah, your own context. So um, I will start with um, a short presentation and then I will provide a walkthrough uh, in the beta platform that, uh, we have uh, been developing and it is now live. So I'm going to share. Do you, do you see this? Let's hope for no more technical problems. Yeah, uh, we can. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So circular legislation for a circular economy. Um, well, our purpose is to accelerate the transition towards a circular economy through more and better use of existing laws and legislations or regulations. And existing is an important word here because we are really looking what is possible now in the current legislation. We have big targets in 2030 
a lot of laws have to be changed to to move towards a truly circular economy but that's going to take a long time and we really want to um, um, make uh, governments decentralized governments able to start using legislation now so this is our network of partners uh, that's been growing over the last two years quite rapidly actually we're developing it we've been um, initiating it uh, as city of amsterdam together with dark metal labs maybe some of you know it and that in the beginning started under the climate kick uh, program and now also flux partners and metabolic are two uh, developing partners and we've been very lucky and, and, and grateful for the, like also a large range of uh, partners that are actually financing uh, circular in the beginning was also climate kick but now also different other decentralized governments so it's provinces we've been uh, and uh, built by nature on the loudest foundation uh, and it's amsterdam a city of amsterdam we've also been investing quite a bit and uh, this week we heard that from the ministry of internal affairs we will also uh, receive quite a big fund a big subsidy which is uh, very very nice and we're working together also with a large network of knowledge partners and this involves uh, the uh, legal faculties of different universities in the netherlands but also for example legal experts of the belasting needs which is the tax office of the netherlands and they have a lot of experience for example in in uh, the digitization of legislation so we learn a lot from them um, but also, for example, in, in the Netherlands, we have the Knowledge Center Euro, uh, Europa Decentral, uh, which is um, a platform that helps uh, policymakers with uh, European legislation and what it means on a decentralized level. And they're also now helping in the development of Circular. Um, but this is our team, and it's been also growing quite, quite a bit. People from different organizations work all together mutually and in a, in a, in a a mutual way also in in this project so we don't we use quite an inno innovative um construction in which we don't work with um opdrachtgever opdrachtnemer for the that we here so not with assignments but we work as a collective and uh yeah what we're trying we've been trying to do since the very beginning is to work in a multidisciplinary way so we combine like more traditional knowledge such as legal knowledge um with uh uh um yeah um, modern let's say modern ways of designing a website from very user-centered so we also have uh strategic and visual designers you experts in the team uh state-of-the-art software developers so that we develop a piece of public tech that really uh fits well with uh with the work environment and the mindsets uh, of the people who in the end uh, have to use it so we do a lot of user research to to um to improve the website all the time so the why um well we in the netherlands we've been working on circular economy policy for quite a bit for quite a while already but after 10 years of circular policy we see we, we have to unfortunately conclude that the circular economy these goals are still way out of sight so probably some of you know the circularity gap report to look at the worldwide state of circular economy and we see that actually uh, there's a decrease in circularity first couple of years ago it was still nine percent and now it's only two seven percent and we see the same on the city level where we have we also developed a circular monitor in amsterdam and we actually uh, in which we um uh, now we uh, visualized and we calculated all the the material flows that flow through in through and out of the city and and also looked at the, at the totals of course and yeah we've our conclusion was also there that uh, we are not on on track to reach our aims and that material consumption is hardly decreasing so um uh, yeah that's also why the netherlands environmental assessment agency lumber of leefomgeving uh in their two and by biyearly reports they recommended to our national government uh this is not going well and um we have huge ambitions but we're not making them and we have to use different kind of policy interventions to reach our aims currently most of the policy interventions focus on experimentation and it's way too voluntary it stimulates experimentation and, and, and innovation but in the end it's insufficient and lacking uh, and they say uh, well governments need to apply more force and coercion and that's we say drang and drang 
like the application of norms, criteria, and pricing in order to yeah, arrive to a system that really benefits circular entrepreneurs and front runners, uh, which is not the case yet. Um, in the Netherlands, we have a company, it's called Royal Hoskoning, and every two years they do research um, and they look at the circular activities of local and regional governments. So the instruments they apply on a decentralized level to stimulate circularity. And they do that every two years as well. And they looked last year at 2,677 instruments. And they found out that only 8% of these instruments are uh, legal instruments. And if you zoom into that, they also did that. Then you find that from these instruments, more, more than half of them was a governance. So that's not very hard or coercive either. So if you re really zoom into the instruments that are actually have more of force and coercion character, then you find only 33 instruments, which is just about 1% of the total amount of instruments that have been applied. So what you see that there's a, a big gap between what is required according to the advisory boards and what is actually happening in practice. So we have been looking from the very start by doing interviews and uh, in depth and, and user tests to understand why are legal instruments not more of, used more often by uh, civil servants? Well, first of all, there is a big knowledge gap about laws and regulations. And this has to do with the inaccessibility and the complexities of laws and regulation. It's crippling for people. And also it requires a lot of individual investment, whereas the return on investment is often very insecure and, and, and very long for people. And it also has to do with the fact that legislation has not been developed to serve transition agendas, which results in a lack of jur jurisdictional coherence. So uh, there are like this public law, private law, fiscal law, it's all very pluriform. And there are not a lot of connections between these different um, legal areas. So also, if you know something about public law, you don't know, still don't know much about fiscal law, for example. So this makes it very complex. And sometimes there are courageous policymakers, for example, who go to legal advisors within their organizations, but then they find out that these uh, legal experts are often super specialized in one area of law. So, um, and, and so this means the answer is often very narrow and there's not a lot to choose from. And you don't get an overview actually of all the possibilities that there are in uh, legislation, in the legislators uh, uh, framework. So, we found we had the same experience actually about three years ago when in 2019 when we were uh, developing the new circular strategy for Amsterdam also as a part of our process we actually found out that we didn't know what kind of which kind of instruments were available um, uh, to strengthen the, this uh, strategy and execution of it um, so uh, what we did actually in our execution program we uh, we also defined a project in which we were going to assess what the possibilities were. And this is actually how Circular started in the very early start. So we just did an analysis of all the opportunities that were there. We started collecting everything that was known. And we looked at other cities, what they were doing. And um, well, we found quite a lot of things, more than we expected. And we started categorizing it. And that's yeah how. And then at some point, we thought this is not only interesting for Amsterdam, but maybe also for other cities. Um, and out of this, and in this period, we also started to get to know interesting people from these legal departments at universities. So together with them and with the tax office, we started developing a method for law analysis. So what we do with that, we actually scrape uh, the laws, you could say, and look uh, at all the different uh, possibilities that are potentially there. We look at public, fiscal, and, and private law. I'll tell a bit more about that in a second. Secondly, um, we make these instruments accessible via the smart, smart platform. I will give you a short walkthrough in a minute. Um, and this will help policymakers, project leads, and buyers to navigate the complexity of the legal uh, framework. And we also found that this is not enough. So first we thought, okay, if we make these available, people will hopefully, because we designed it well, start working with them. But it needs more activation and it needs more guidance in application because people are professionals are not used to implementing 
legal instruments. It's they are used to, for example, uh, develop a knowledge consortium. They sometimes uh, develop um, and publish new uh, subsidies. But legal instruments is quite a different ball game. And lastly, we assist in the application of mix of instruments. I will also tell more about that in a minute. And actually, one of the experts we were working together with said, "You're actually what you're doing is you're going from law as a text to law as a service, which is quite nice in the in the looking into the circular economy uh, jargon, law as a service." Um, well, this is an, a simplified overview of uh, the method for law analysis that we developed. And this is also interesting um, because in in the future we want to test this method also in different legal contexts in different countries internationally. That's also why I'm showing showing why I'm showing it to you. So the first step in it is uh, we look at we take a certain theme because if you ask the question to a legal expert like can you give me the legal instruments that are available to accelerate the circular economy, then I say, well, what is the circular economy? It's way too broad and too vague. So we ended up to uh, at the level of different teams. So on, currently on circular, you can find, for example, timber construction, circular mattress chain, and circular wind turbines as teams. Uh, and then from this team, for example, timber construction, we start to analyze uh, this team. And we look at the different uh, chain phases. So from resources to uh, uh, to design, production, the use, and the last phase, like the, the waste phase, the, which we are not calling it waste phase anymore. So we look at these different phases. What do we want to achieve in these phases? What are the hotspots? Where are the trigger points where we can do something with? And um, from there, we do a demarcation of the, we determine the legal work area. So we look what kind of laws are actually interesting to look at, because there are hundreds even thousands of laws and um yeah we're trying to select the most relevant which is often 30 30 laws then we look at all these laws we do an analysis per legal article per provision in these laws and we look at them from different angles in a creative way like what is possible how can you use this article where is the space where how can you use it in a in a way that it stimulates um or even uh, enforces circularity and then we value these instruments, we add information so that, and I will show that on the platform that you can, in the end, uh, with, uh, we datafy it actually so that you can search in the instruments and that you allow possibility, uh, uh, allow uh, to categorize and to, to organize the, the, the different instruments. And then a very important step, we also have copy content expert on board is to rewrite this legal output that comes from legal experts in our team to understandable and apl applicable language, because in the end it's non-legal uh, people who have to apply it. So we want to make, and that's that's quite a difficult job actually, uh, uh, but, uh, and one of the biggest challenges for us. And in the end, what we're trying to achieve with that is to, to offer concrete options for actions. And actually, the core, the essence is that we want to offer legal action perspectives for circular policymakers, project leads, and, and buyers of local and regional authorities. So, what does the platform have to offer now? Oh, I'm going to a different screen. Um, so, this is it. This is what it is now. Uh, it's still, um, as you can see, a beta version of Circular. We've been launching it in February. Uh, we've been developing different prototypes, which have led to this version. Uh, and although it, it's well designed, but, um, it's just a better version. So uh, now we only have three different teams and they're quite different in nature. This, we did this on purpose because we wanted to test the method for law analysis, but also the whole structure of the website to see if it works on, on uh, different teams, for example, in construction, but also in consumption goods. Um, no, if you look at the website, you can see the different teams and some information about what Circular is. And here is the news. I will see if I can translate it. So we can also, yeah. So it's the normal website is just in uh, in Dutch. There is a 
an English shorter version of a website, which we will, when we have developed the platform a bit further, we will translate it more into English. But now, if you want to check, give some information or share with you, you can uh, you can click on the English version, which is uh, just an explanation of the website. We go back to the to the normal website. Yeah, you can some, find some information about what Circular is. With a new section here. And then, uh, well, the, all the content is under the different teams. So, for example, timber construction, if we go there, there's some information about timber construction here. And then what we see is three different types of overviews where we actually stored the and present the, uh, in, uh, the instruments. And here are some highlighted instruments. Um, and these are often the instruments that have been applied already, for example, by other uh, cities or you know, um, provinces which also offer some some uh, guidelines and some examples uh, and well when we go to the list uh, here you find a list of 31 timber construction measures and they're all here and it's possible to to actually um, to filter on well to filter on some of the instruments have an example or, or um, guiding uh, guidelines but it's also possible to filter on your uh, government level. So you can select the national, provincial, or municipal. And here it's, it says it's zero because it's translated to English, so it's not right anymore. And then um, you can select on the different um, legislative uh, domains, uh, but also on the air ladder. So you can, if you want to select the measures that have an effect high on the R ladder, R ladder uh, then you can select them here. Well, if you look, on a, uh, for example, the instrument. This is the instrument page. So here on the left side is a short description of this instrument. And we try to keep this short and digestible as possible. So just what is it? How can you use it? And information from practice. So also links to other websites or places where this already has been applied. Uh, and we give some information about requirements and restrictions and the legal, more technical explanation. And here on the right side, you see on which, so in this case, it's, it has an effect on all uh, uh, R's on the R ladder. And uh, we also developed a system that gives an indication of the legal, in, uh, of, of the influence and the legal visibility of, of the instrument. So it's just an indication. It's, it doesn't have a scientific base. We cannot do that for all instruments, especially if they never have been applied. And here you can find some information. The estimated influence on of a measure is based on the enforceability, how much direct influence the instrument has, how long it works, and how many people it concerns. So based on this, we make an estimation on if it's a limited average or high influence. And the legal feasibility has to do um, with how risky an instrument is. So what is the risk of failure? Uh, and this has to do, for example, with the amount of uh, jurisprudence that is there, how often it has been applied. Um, well, second overview we have is the overview which shows the instruments in conjunction. So what, I cannot translate this because it's an image, uh, but what you see here actually is financing, experimentation, rules about reuse, policy form, uh, formation. So what you actually see here is clusters of the of those same 32 instruments. So that gives more of an overview for users. And from the user tests, it appears that users find this really useful and interesting to see how this these instruments, the different the instruments with the same nature are clustered, but also how they are interrelated. For example, here if you um, uh, uh, the connection between uh, environmental vision, environmental program, and how it uh, is related to an uh, environmental legislation for ordering and plan, environmental plan. Um, and then the last overview we have is by government authority. So, for example, timber construction shows really well in the chain that governments are interdependent and that they really need to collaborate well to make a chain work well. For example, on a national level, there are opportunities to to work on the different taxes for bio-based materials and um, uh, regional authorities and provinces have they they, they have uh, authorities that uh, see on nature 
nature conservation so, so they can for example increase the, the wood production whereas on the city level it's possible to uh, set criteria for construction that more bio-based materials are used for example so this really and we see that every time we do a lot an analysis of the chain uh, that the legal instruments and the authorities are dispersed over the different governments and 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 also it shows the necessity to collaborate uh, within a circular economy and I think even more than other transitions and well we hope that this also helps that what you see off to see now is that different government levels are pointing at each other like now but we don't have instruments they are responsible and they're the other way around so that it also yeah leads to a change there in the way uh, collaboration takes place so to get back to the presentation three more slides um, this is where we stand now and um, we have a few quite a lot of things that we are working on with the team actually big next thing that we are going to develop we are actually developing we're building a lot of knowledge and a system for it at the moment and we hope by the end of the year to publish the first um, version of, of this uh, web section is EU legislation. So we're currently doing a, a thorough analysis of all the relevant um, uh, EU legislation that is coming at us and um, also what it means um, for decentralized governments. So what are the opportunities? Uh, what are the new authorities and powers that come out of it? And we are now uh, building knowledge also and we're publishing uh, white papers, uh, which are already available through our open research website, which I can share in the chat. Um, so this is a big next step. And we are working on policy instruments and uh, mixes and coherence. So in, in the future, uh, we also want to inspire policymakers, for example, to combine instruments more. So if you use a harder legal measure, like forbid something, um in a few years for example the usage of a certain polluting material then it's even stronger if you combine it with a subsidy that helps companies uh arrive to that point to to develop new products for example or and at the same time also um, organize a, a knowledge network or an innovation network where can they they can work together to actually arrive there and uh, we call this levers for change and we are also spending a lot of time and effort on defining what actually is the right service we can offer so in one way we are offering now for example these um, guidelines on the website or explaining how uh, through examples how others did it but we still see that it needs a lot of activation for people to start working with legal instruments so we are now in the metropolitan region of Amsterdam. There's a collective uh, working on timber, collective of different municipalities. Together with them, we're going to test in the coming half year as community of practice to see how it works if different cities at the same time start implementing uh, the same uh, instruments and learn from each other while doing this. And we want to uh, uh, abstract a model from it that we can uh, apply to other existing communities of practice in the Netherlands and we see more and more that this is probably a good way to to give guidance uh, and help in a scalable manner so that's it for now and um, I think we still have about 20 minutes so uh, maybe nice to have a chat about this together and hear about your reflections and ideas Yes, thank you so much, Arden. It was extremely knowledgeable and informative, and I'm sure all of you enjoyed it as much as I did. And now I would really like to open a common room for discussion, and maybe you guys can ask more questions and let's discuss with each other. Uh, I see Peter's hand. Maybe, Peter, you can go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think it's very uh, was very nice presentation, good presentation, and a very good initiative to uh, to assess all the uh, law because it has enormous impact for uh, stimulating this uh, circular economy. I was wondering, uh, I, I'm not an expert on it, but you hear so much about uh, legislation rules that hinders circular economy. Did you also assess this this kind of rules law that that slows down this the circular economy? And uh, that's the first question. The second question is that the law is so uh, uh, 
yeah, national oriented. Um, we have the Dutch law, it's different as the German law. So the international comparison, I think it's quite uh, difficult to, to, to do because the, the law is so nationally oriented. These are my two questions. Thank you, Peter. Mm -hmm. yeah, very good questions and very valid as well. Uh, yeah, I think um, barriers and legislation is one of the yeah the biggest barriers in the in the in the acceleration of circular economy. You heard it a lot from from entrepreneurs as well. Uh, we what we're doing now here is what we call the, the our, uh, green heat map of legislation. So, what is the activating legislation? How can you push circular economy through legislation? And actually, what your, your question about the barriers we call this in our team the uh, red heat map so um and we in the netherlands we have different uh, places where as an entrepreneur you can uh, uh give a, a notification of barriers so in the mra rotterdam is one and selling it has uh, like me um they're not working together as well as it should, but there are places where they can do it. And it often appears that in practice, it's not the law itself, but the interpretation of the law that causes problems. At this point, uh, we're still focusing on the green heat map because it's already very complex and we have to, yeah, we have to bring in a focus. Um, but we see that Circular can in the future also be a central place where all the different um, barriers that come in through these different loquettes, <laughs> uh, different desks, uh, that they can also come together and should come together at one point at a central place so that, for example, the omgevings teams, the environmental body services, that they can also learn from each other how to interpret these laws uh, or the bar these barriers in a different way, because in, the, in practice you see often that more is possible. So we see that as a, yeah, as a future possibility to develop, but at the moment, um, yeah, we, we have to it's already so much, so we have to uh, try and focus on on this on the green uh, green map. And the second question, um, oh sorry, you wanted to respond. Uh, no, no, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, second one is also very relevant, and this is something we really want to test. So we believe that um, you cannot just copy this list of timber in, uh, uh, legal instruments uh, and copy them to another country, of course, because it's different laws. But we believe that the underlying principles can be used. Uh, for example, uh, uh, MPG. Well, what's a good example? For example, the fact that you in an, in a license that you can demand certain things um, that that principle can be used in a different context. But then sometimes you have to find the right laws that that are connected to it again, and that's an assumption. And uh, that's also this, uh, we, we build uh, Circular in a way that is uh, replicable. So it's open source. So you, the platform itself is just you, the whole techniques of it and all the coding is open source. We also publish it on GitHub so it can be used in a different country. And also the method, uh, I just shared the link of open research, the method for law analysis can also be used in a different legal context. And we, we next step is, that we are looking for a partner uh, abroad to um, to start experimenting with this. We're thinking of Copenhagen now, for example, we have first conversations to start small and see how does this method for law analysis work in a different national legal context. And lastly, about this question, we are very happy with all the legislation that comes from Europe because a lot of directives have to be uh, put into national legislation which also causes a uniformification or to more uniformity in uh, the national uh, uh, legislative networks. So that's a, that's a good thing from this perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, maybe Simon, you can go next with your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Um, one uh, maybe a provocative question. Please. Uh, we we all know that uh, I think the the overall goal should be uh, let's say sustainability, sustainable development. Uh, however, if you look into academia, uh, circularity is not necessarily also uh, sustainability because sometimes the social aspects and also the environmental aspects when it comes to GG emissions are not uh, covered because you have 
really to look into the, uh, let's say, the resource streams and also doing uh, life cycle analysis about the, uh, the GHG emissions. Uh, and on the other hand, there are also some other, well, upcoming interesting laws when it's coming to the Green Deal or when it's coming to uh, the German legislation, which has been passed this year. Uh, this is called the uh, Supply Chain Act. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which, which accounts for uh, for companies regarding social aspects, also uh, some kind some environmental aspects, uh, and this will also be uh, will be I think proposed on a European uh, scale. Uh, so, uh, how would you deal with that? <laughs> That's a very big question. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, the due diligence directive is, is arriving now in in Europe, which is quite similar to what uh, has been implemented in Germany, I think. And it looks uh, cross-chain and environmental and ecological and it's a little like a yeah. Um, can you specify the question because it's it's very open now. <clears throat> yes. Uh, well, if you if you look into academia, uh, I, I I saw some papers uh, who were like, yeah, is uh, circularity sustainable? Yeah, and uh, they. Um, I think from a from a from a from a uh, from a point of view, you have scarce resources and so on. You need to uh, you need to uh, go really to a, a circular economy. It absolutely makes sense. However, uh, sometimes, but it also depends on product design. It's uh, from an ecological perspective. Uh, not very sustainable to uh, come to come to a circularity because you need much more energy and much more GHG emissions to to make it uh, circular and it would be uh, sometimes better to to use the uh, resources coming from the ground. However, but also this is also a question about how about product design and but sometimes you cannot really uh, design the product circular. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this would be the question: How you deal with I think materials, uh, if you have got this act, um, do people really need to act circular uh, in case it would, wouldn't be very sustainable to do this? Yeah, I understand your question. It's also, I think, part of the whole degrowth discussion that is uh, currently going on. And I really like this discussion to follow it. At the same time, it's always when we work, when you work on a project like this, it's I'm trying to avoid it a little bit because we, we're trying to make things also um, more practical. Um, and well, most practically looking at this, we, we use this, this R letter. So I think uh, the highest form of circularity is refuse or totally rethink. Um, and we're, and often when you look at this different uh, change in the uh, phases in the value chain, they are often more in the in the first steps of the of the of the chain, and so we're also looking really hard to find the legal instruments that are actually trying to do something there. For example, we're looking at if you look at the local fiscal instruments. Um, no, sorry, yeah, local, yeah. Um, we are looking at um, uh, commercials. Like, can you forbid certain commercials uh, within the city? Uh, that are very polluting or that uh, stimulate uh, certain behavior that you actually really don't want, like fossil or meat or... So yeah, we're trying to look, that's just one example, but so that's, I think, all we can do uh, about this. But yeah, I'm, I'm following the discussion and I I think it's really, uh, in a broader sense, it's, it's a very interesting uh, question. Um, I like also that this, uh, yeah, the, the different paradigms this discussion about these different paradigms. Yeah. And we also know some we're working with the donuts, maybe you know, donut economics together with Kate Rayward. So it also addresses a lot of these questions, like really looking into this chain. And in the monitor, we're also looking at the MK, MKI, so the environmental costs, um, trying to to valor uh, to um, calculate this. Yeah. So we're trying to make this practical. Thank you, Ariel. We also have one more hand from Dagmar. Maybe Dagmar, you can. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for doing this presentation. I've seen it before, but now I, now you need to see it twice to really start thinking, I realize. Um, one of the things, uh, as you know, we are working right now on an interact project uh, with MOSFETs Europe. So that's also, some of the project partners are here from Germany and Belgium. Um, I heard you saying that now you're talking with Copenhagen about uh, now, change to into copy this 
But I think it would be really interesting to do it also for Germany and Belgium, because you could, then you can get this cross-border um, aspect in it. And that is something that I, because many of our companies work in this area and they cross the borders and they're dealing with these two uh, system or three systems of laws. So yeah, maybe it would be also very interesting to actually look into this area. This was my first thought. Um, and then I have a question that was more common than that. This would be a question. Um, did I understand it right? This instrument is primarily targeting governments, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, okay. And uh, is there also then this what I'm in the target group? Um, and can I, I'm an urban planner, can I filter on urban planning? Something like that. Is that a possibility? Um, well, we now have one that is uh, one filter is environmental law, like Omgevingsrecht, uh, which is not exactly the same, but you will get most of the results, I think. But we're still, the, the, everything is still in development. So the filters, if it turned out that urban planning would should be a very well, valuable filter, then we could add it. Okay, now that's more a question. So when I, uh, so you, you can filter on environmental law. Um, but it is always laws. It is not that you're referring, because one of the instruments we use is inspiration, right? Inspiration is not a law. It's a very soft thing. Yes. Um, is that something that you're incorporating here? Yeah, and in, in circular, well, we're also here trying to uh, keep our focus because otherwise, again, if we use the entire policy uh, toolbox that we have as governments, it's going to be super huge again. So the, the key thing is, is legal instruments. But one of the last slides I showed about policy instruments could be as um, also as an inspiration to use inspiration in the application of uh, a legal instrument to combine it with another policy instrument such as information, inspiration. Um, and, and also apart from that, we hope that Circular itself is uh, inspirational and that also the examples that are put on the website are inspirational enough. One thing I didn't explain is also that we are developing a facility that uh, with which users can actually, if they have a successful or more, also maybe also in, unsuccessful application of a legal instrument, that they can give their feedback so that it arrives on the website and that it really becomes a platform for users where they can share this and we hope especially also that these examples of successful applications can be very inspirational for application for other uh, um, cities or provinces okay thank you uh thank you so much Aaron. uh yeah maybe diane you can go ahead with your question Yes, uh, thank you, sir. And also thank you, Arjan, for this very uh, insightful uh, presentation. I knew that uh, I, I knew the start, but now you're you're already miles and miles uh, further. So it's good to see this uh, once more where circular now is. And building a bit further on on Dagmar's question, I think a lot of people in this in this conversation uh, are also urban planners, or at least in the in the in the in the sure Euro Delta um, uh, cooperation. Um, and now you build up the tool through themes, uh, 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 wood and to uh, building a wood and through other to other themes. But um, there is this big new law coming up in, in, in the Netherlands, which you uh, already mentioned, the environmental law, Omgevingswet, uh, which also which already has the goal of integrating well 60 other laws. Um, I was wondering if you also do analysis, you know, from um, from the law perspective, so not for one particular team, but from the law perspective, okay, this comes into force uh, January the 1st, uh, what opportunities or chances does this bring? Have you been looking at that as well? Yeah, great question as well. Um, we actually, we are at the um, uh, beginning of a new Dorotwikling, uh, this is a new uh, through development, how do you say Dorotwikling? Mm -hmm a new phase of, of quite restructuring and development of the website. So, uh, and that, this is actually one of the, the starting points for that, um, that we uh, we found that a lot of the instruments that are, can be used, for example, in timber construction, they all, can also be applied in different different areas of, of uh, urban development, construction, area development. So 
we are already seeing from an, our analysis that there are some like cross cutting instruments, uh, a lot from Omgevers that I've run a lot, we've been doing a lot of analysis on them. We ho really hope that it's going to be implemented on the 1st of January 2024, because we're ready for it. The instruments are already on the website, but we all want to present them like uh, in a way that they're a lot broader uh, applicable. Uh, we're also working on a new way where we can do more teams uh, in a faster way so that we can broaden the amount of instruments that are available on the website uh, in a quicker way so that in a year or so we are more circular wide because now it's just three teams it's of course yeah. it's, it's very very small very marginal actually if you look at the whole circular economy yeah so um, yeah and we're also want to want to do it from more from an instruments perspective like uh, present the instruments more central and how they can uh, apply it in a, in a much broader sense, for example, in our room planning. Cool. Yeah, I think it would be really valuable for our urban planning and area development colleagues if they, you know, January 1st and then they somehow see, okay, did you know that this was possible with the current environmental law? Uh, 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 if you want to know more details, dive into your uh, circular tooling. I think this provides huge opportunities. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we hear, we hear that we've heard that more. So yeah, well, well yeah, it's, uh, it's it's cool that you well, see that we've been working together on this, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Maybe we have a couple of more hands here. So maybe Mulu, you can go first, and then Dagmar. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, maybe a little bit more of the same from uh, what Jan I think uh, was just talking about. Uh, from a communi communications point of view, the first thing I always look for is, uh, why would I do this? And I'm just wondering, like, uh, people will go here because they want to build circular, but is there also something that can point out the advantages of doing it circular if you use these tools and regulations instead of doing it non-circular? Like, it, is that incorporated at all? Like, um, yeah. Very good point. Yeah, very good point. Um, it's also quite a uh, complicated question some, because you, you can give some data on why it's better. But I think it go, this question goes a lot deeper also from like an internal drive perspective. So we also have a yeah. researcher on board who's looking at um, uh, incentives and the barriers personally that people have to start working with these legal instruments, as we saw in the numbers, it's just only 1% of the instruments is legal. So there's something going on there. So why do people not use it more? And I think it's also part of the culture within organizations. So I think they uh, also employees have to feel strengthened and feel supported by management to actually and also be uh, rewarded to use these more difficult uh, um, instruments. So it's it has a lot of aspects to it, I think a lot of dimensions. <laughs> Um, but I think on the website we could, there could be more words and, and space to actually incentivize people on it, yes. Yes, I think the reward part of this uh, is very important. Like what you said, you have to put more effort into it. So you also want uh, things out of it as a user. And it would be very helpful for people like me to sell this uh, tool. You know, if you can tell people what they can get out of it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the suggestion. Take it along. Thank you. Maybe Dagmar, we have one more question from you. Uh, I think she's frozen. Anyway, I have one last question from my side. So uh, Aryan, as Dagmar mentioned earlier also that we uh, your Delta actually is a huge mega region that is a cross-border area that goes between four countries. And how would you give, uh, uh, how do you see that, uh, what is required to upscale this instrument like circular on this short Euro Delta level? Because it has different governances, different countries. How do you think we can upscale this kind of instrument? Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, well, I've already mentioned that we are really anticipating on this upscaling and making everything replicable as far as it gets. Um, I believe that and that's also why we want to 
start small, but if you really want to do it well with like a partner city, that capacity really needs to be available at that city. And that is strongly linked to our uh, team. And that somebody's just maybe full-time trying to start setting this up and implementing this in another city. I've my experiences with a lot of city networks as well, is that if you just uh, share information about this and inspire each other about this, that it's very hard to really set something like this up. So I think very close collaboration, it requires a lot of investment. But that's also as sort of a satellite, somebody, maybe one or two people are really starting to do it in another city is really, especially in the beginning, uh, first steps in internationalization is, is really uh, necessary to, to actually realize it. Okay, thank you. Maybe looking at the time, I'll have one last question from Dagmar before we close the session. Uh, actually, uh, sorry, I didn't realize it's one o'clock because I was curious. I wanted to ask uh, our foreigner, um, because this was about Dutch law, so obviously all the Dutch people put their hands up and uh, the CIMA, of course. Alfredo, do you know anything like that? Is that anything like that in Belgium? Have you ever seen something like this? Um, no, no, I have. I haven't seen what I have seen. It. I was sharing actually at, uh, in the chat at the European level. There was this uh, urban agenda partnership on circular economy, and and one of the action plan was on the action where to to uh, to see the obst legal obstacle, regulatory obstacle. Yeah. But of course, um, related to EU law, uh, not not several national law. But no, I haven't seen. I have always heard that regulatory is one of of the constraints to um, but uh, such an analysis no uh, that's why it was very interesting despite the fact of course that uh, the instrument is for for the netherlands but the fact that a kind of instrument like that exists is pretty interesting yeah we're really our mission is almost to get the red tape association uh, away that is not only an opt obstacle but that we really that it's a, a critical instrument legislation is critical to actually yes, uh, accelerate the transition and to also we hope that more and more people will realize this and get the mindset okay maybe just to finish uh vivian one last quick question yeah uh no i, I if i understood well uh you said um that there's a, a kind of a test case uh, in uh, in the metropolitan region of Amsterdam. So I was wondering if this te test case has started and maybe suggest that uh, if it just started and there is time to get back to that, uh, maybe in some months, that uh, that we probably, you'll be the, the host of another meet and learn case that, that we know how it's going on because I think that might be actually important to, to see how progresses are developing. Yeah, I've been super happy to do this. I think in the beginning of 2024, we'll, I will have a, hopefully a story to tell with my team because we're starting about now. We now have the plan ready to, and we will start uh, like within the coming weeks. So um, yeah, and, and it will take about half a year until the end of the year. So uh, we're very happy. I'm very curious to see what comes out of it as well. And very happy to to, to share it with you in, in a similar session in the beginning of next year. Can I have one last yes, comment? Sorry, Susan. Because I really think since now we've been working so much on cross-border cooperation uh, recently, uh, I would really recommend that if you, at a certain point you will start looking into these cross-border issues, because this is actually what really all these cities in the, on the borders are facing. From Amsterdam, this always feeds far away, but uh, for many of these cities, this is really actually daily life. I will also send you a paper that uh, was done in uh, Finland and Sweden, where they actually also were looking at the legal issues about wood. Uh, also with construction, circular wood construction. Thank you for that. And also curious to hear more about the advantages of, of uh, starting with cross-border co collaboration as first steps, because I, to be honest, never really thought about this, about that this could have advantages. So in this, from, a, uh, from the 
the perspective and the context that we are working in. So, um, yeah, if you if you could share something with me, then that could yeah. be really nice. Also. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Much. All right, thank you so much, uh, Aryan, and everybody who attended the session. It was extremely uh, knowledgeable for me. I think for all of us. And uh, like all good, all good things, this session should come to an end as well. But before we end, just a quick reminder that uh, Meet and Learn is a recurring uh, lecture series that is organized on every last Friday of the month. So maybe if you are interested, you can join again in our further discussions. We are quite extensively talking about circularity and towards the circularity of Euro de Delta in general. And seeing how best practices are done everywhere else and to learn from each other. So this is why this lecture series is called Meet and Learn. And maybe one very quick last uh, hand raise from Jacqulin and we close the session. Thank you for this last moment. Um, I'm representing ITEM, a research institute of the University of Maastricht, really focusing on cross-border cooperation. And that's why I just want to say hello and a message from ITEM, that if there are questions, we always want to think together about uh, how to uh, strengthening the relation with Germany and Belgium and how we can uh, make it more stronger. So. That was the last thing. And thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Uh, thank you very much. so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you Yasmin. Yeah. I would like to now uh, just say goodbye and close the session. And thank you, everyone, for joining. You can also find our link in the chat for seeing our further uh, updates on next uh, lectures. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye. 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 Bye.